for them. So good evening uh, and welcome to the third in our, in our special series of Academy of Ideas online events. This one is called International Disorder, Has COVID-19 Killed Globalism? I'm Alice Donald. I'm Associate Director at the uh, Academy of Ideas and the co-convener of the Battle of Ideas Festival. Now, at Academy of Ideas, we've been far from idle uh, over the past three months. In fact, everyone in the office uh, has continued working full time right the way through the lockdown. Uh, we've been programming the festival uh, for later in the year and organizing lots of these on, on, online events, whether they be book clubs or forums that cover everything from the economy to arts to social policy. And it's uh, been a particularly tough uh, situation financially for us because we're an organization that relies on putting on events and that's the way that we managed to raise sponsorship and the way that we bring money into the organization. And obviously we haven't been able to do that over the past three months. So if anybody is in a position uh, to help keep us going by making a financial contribution, then please do visit our website and hit the donate button. That's www.academyofideas.org.uk uh, donate. And if you can uh, give us anything at all, uh, as you can see on the screen there, anything from five pounds to a hundred pounds, then we'd be really, really grateful because everything, every contribution that you can make uh, helps us uh, keep going throughout this uh, pretty tough period. So uh, to tonight's discussion, I think uh, a paradox of the period that we're living through just now is that at the very moment of a pandemic crisis, uh, when life in so many countries has been arrested, the suspension of economic activity, the suspension of social and cultural affairs, that at the same time we seem to be in the midst of an acceleration in terms of the transformation of international relations. Obviously, the world's attention for the last few days has been focused on the United States, and it's been quite interesting to see how the internal disarray in the United States has has translated fairly quickly amongst commentators into the notion of the US as a failed state and then uh, further into questions over the future of the US-led global order. We've also been seeing in recent weeks the question of China raise itself in various different forms, whether it's been the spat with the United States over the, the virus and how it's spread, or more recently its intervention into Hong Kong, which is creating all sorts of tensions. We've seen in the European Union uh, the struggle really to create any sort of unified response to the crisis, the arguments over how to secure the economic future, arguments between the different states within the European Union, and also between the European Union and, uh, for example, the United States and China. So there, there seem to be frictions and tensions throughout uh, the international world just now. Uh, and that's what we want to explore tonight. So there's obviously no, uh, no shortage of things that have been happening that we can discuss and try and make sense of. It seems to me a very good opportunity to ask what is new uh, about the current situation, what's a continuation of uh, trends that were previously happening, perhaps buried beneath the surface and have been brought to the surface by this crisis. Uh, and I suppose what the implications might be for these, these trends, both in terms of the global world order, uh, but also for its, its institutions and also domestic politics as well, and the, the, the politics around uh, the nation state. So to help us uh, try and unravel some of these questions tonight, we've got four speakers. Uh, I'm gonna introduce them in the order that they're going to speak in. So firstly, uh, we're going to hear from Dr. Philip Cunliffe. Philip's a senior lecturer in politics and international relations at the University of Kent. He's the author of a number of books, most recently and most importantly for this discussion, uh, Cosmopolitan Dystopia, International Inf Intervention and the Failure of the West, which you can find on Amazon at a quite a reduced price just now. So good do uh, check out that, that book. And Philip's also co-founder of The Full Brexit and uh, their website's well worth a visit uh, for all sorts of articles on, on, on both domestic UK politics, but also how the UK fits within the European Union and more broadly international. So that's Philip and welcome to you, Philip. Secondly, we'll be hearing from Mary Dzerzhevsky. Uh, Mary is a writer and a broadcaster. She works primarily for UK-based uh, newspapers such as The Independent and The Guardian, but brings, very much brings an international perspective to that by covering international affairs. And Mary's been a, a foreign correspondent in quite a number of major cities throughout the world, uh, Paris, 
Moscow and Washington are certainly worth uh, mentioning, and also a special correspondent in China. So welcome to you, Mary. It's uh, great to have you here. Mary's a Battle of Ideas regular, and it's nice to be able to bring you into this uh, online forum. Third, we'll be hearing from Lord Morris Glassman. Uh, Morris is a Labour life peer. He's often associated with Blue Labour, which he helped establish more than a decade ago now. Uh, he's the director of the Common Good Foundation, uh, and he's author of Unnecessary Suffering, Manage Market, Managing Market Utopia. And he, Morris is doing a lot of work just now trying to uh, look at the tensions between the nation state and globalization and has written uh, in some interesting articles on that. So welcome to you, Morris. Uh, and finally, uh, in terms of the speaker order, we'll be hearing from Joan Hoy. Joan's uh, Director Europe of the Economist Intelligence Unit, um, which is the business arm of, of, of the Economist Group. Joan specialises in democracy, country risk, geopolitics, and also quite importantly and interestingly, she's editor of the EIU's flagship annual, annual Democracy Index, which is available on the EIU website. And it's worth uh, signing up to the EIU website, I think, because not only can you get hold of that, but there's lots of kind of interesting reports that Joan and her team are publishing uh, just now on, on the geopolitical situation. So in terms of format, I've asked them to uh, kick us off with about five, six minutes of opening thoughts on uh, this theme of international disorder. Uh, we'll then come out to, to all of you for your questions and points. As I said earlier, uh, the, way to, the way that you can speak is to raise hand within the, the panel, the participants panel. Uh, we'll get you queuing up and I'll, I'll be able to take you in. I'll periodically come back after a few questions to the panel for, for some of their thoughts and then back out again and so on and so forth. So, uh, and remember the chat box is open uh, for comments. So, um, Philip, do you want to kick us off with, with your opening thoughts? Thank you very much, Alistair, and um, thanks also to the Academy of Ideas for hosting this and for putting together, for making the effort to continue public life um, and the public, public debate and public sphere in the midst of the corona pandemic. So uh, I wanted, in terms of my opening remarks, just to say a few things, I suppose, to frame uh, the discussion. The first would be a warning, um, which is to say that I think it's very easy to fall into traps with discussing the COVID pandemic, to say things like Corona has caused this, Corona has caused that, Corona is responsible for this, Corona is responsible for that. And it's always worth, I think, in any of these kinds of discussions to step back a bit and to remind ourselves that we're talking about um, something that's ultimately tremendously banal. It's a virus. It has no agency, it has no platform, it has no policy, it has no organization, it has no institution. Um, it can only affect pre-existing trends. So when we discuss the impact of corona, it behooves us to very um, correctly identify the trends that were already in play before we can correctly or uh, make an effort to identify how, by, how corona might affect those trends, how it might amplify them, how it might retard them, how it might inflect them in different ways. So that would be the first um, significant point, I think, to, to stress, is that before discussing the effect of corona, it's worth identifying what the pre-existing trends were in order to think about how corona will in turn affect them. Uh, the next thing I would say would be to split apart globalism from globalization. So the way in which the discussion has been framed is around globalism rather than is around globalization, which I think is, uh, is important and it's worth drawing attention to the distinction. So if we think of globalism as a particular political and legal framework in which globalization has been encased, globalization being separate, um, I mean, there's overlap, but nonetheless, there are two distinct kinds of things. So whereas globalism, we could think of as a set of political structures and legal institutions and attitudes and dispositions associated with those structures, globalization being a series of processes, um, economic and political processes and economic and political relationships. And so they're two separate things. So with respect to how Corona, whether or not Corona has broken globalism or broken globalization, I would say to think about it, um, it's important to understand globalization not as a thing, but rather as a set of contradictory dynamics, as a set, like I say, of shifting political and economic relationships. 
Um, and insofar as Corona has impacted them, it's very ambivalent in terms of its effects. The global connectivity that helped spread the virus so fast is also in many ways the precondition for fighting the virus. If we think about how quickly the genome of the virus was decoded by Chinese scientists and rapidly spread through scientific networks, the technology that makes possible fighting the virus um, also depends on the very same global connectivity and interdependence that spread the virus in the first place. And so all the scientific cooperation, all the sharing of data, all of those things that we associate with um, certain of uh, globalized, institutionalized, kind of globalized relationships mean that globalization um, will remain. And it should remain indeed if we, for all sorts of reasons, but not least to fight the virus. I mean, if you just think about the vaccine, um, in order if the vaccine, when we get a vaccine, if we get the vaccine, in order for it to be effective, it will have to be applied on a global scale in order to be um, meaningful, in order to eradicate the virus fully. So what I want to stress then is that in terms of Corona can't kill globalization. Um, and indeed, nor would we wish it to because those globalization, the interconnectivity and the interdependence and the, uh, what that allows us to do is very important, not least in the fight against Corona. However, as respect to Corona and globalism, that's a different picture and many of the, the or rather the model of globalism that was um, that we saw that we have had for the last 20 30 years or so that was already fracturing um, prior to corona and corona has i think in many ways accelerated that disintegration and this process of fracture was evidenced in different ways um, it was evidenced in the rust belt in the us boosting trump into the white house it was evidenced in the Brexit secession from the European Union. And that model of globalism against which both the election of Donald Trump and the Brexit withdrawal from the European Union, Britain's withdrawal from the European Union, that model of globalism was the idea of keeping all of these political and legal infrastructure and institutions and power structures insulated from public debate and public accountability and from public pressure and keeping them remote and um, and distant from any kind of capacity for public power to shape them or to reshape them, insulated in effect from democratic agency and democratic input. Um, and so this model of politics, which was justified by supranational authority, whatever legitimacy it had, it's been hollowed out by the lack of democratic input. Um, and so what I would say then is that insofar as it was already fragmenting and fracturing across the last few years, and insofar as Corona might help accelerate the disintegration of that model of globalism, it gives us an opportunity to reboot it on a democratic basis so that we can recast the character of international relationships around the world in a way in which has um, greater democratic input and also has stronger roots in democratic societies and within nation states themselves. So that requires obviously um, democratic renewal. Um, and that democratic renewal, if we are to reforge international relationships on a more sustainable long-term basis, the, that need for democratic renewal needs to happen on the grounds within nation states themselves. So the paradox of the situation is that the only way to reforge international relations in, in as much as they might be fractured or fragmented during the pandemic and during the current broader global crisis, the only way to renew them is within nation states themselves. And that's the core paradox of um, international politics, I think, in the aftermath of the disintegration of globalism. Now, um, and I'll um, kind of close up my opening remarks with this to go back and stress the um, point that I started with, which is that Corona will not do this of its own accord. So if Corona is fragmenting and um, helping to accelerate the disintegration of, glo of globalism, it will certainly not um, rectify globalism. It will not put a new model of international connectivity or a new model of international interaction, a new model of international cooperation in its place. And you only need to think about the situation that we're in at the moment. Um, democracy cannot be restored while the public sphere is constituted like this. While our civil liberties are curtailed, while our um, ability to interact with each other and to maintain public pressure on government and to integrate and to relate to the public and to relate to each other as individuals is so dramatically um, restricted. 
So I would finish on this, that um, it's not the virus that's significant, but our response to the virus. And thus far, it seems to me that um, one of the most dispiriting and disheartening aspects of the pandemic is how we've allowed the virus to amplify all the negative trends of contemporary life. Um, the politics of fear and the atomization that's associated with the politics of fear, um, an inflated state power, but which is a state power which is very hollow and coercive and is unable to draw on legitimacy or able to mobilize people in an effective way. These empty rituals of solidarity that we engage in, kind of clapping from our balconies or windows or wherever we might be, on the street corners or in our doorways, these are effectively empty rituals of solidarity and they reproduce political passivity of citizens. And all of this, um, all of this has to be pushed aside if we are to reconstitute our societies in the wake of globalism and in the wake of the collapse of globalism. And Corona isn't going to do that for us. And thus far, like I say, we've allowed ourselves to be made passive before Corona and we will never be able to reshape those international and democratic national relations unless we're willing to brush aside the politics of fear associated with the pandemic. Thank you. OK, thanks very much, Phil. That was that was really useful, actually. Very, uh, very clear and a really useful challenge at the end. So thanks for that. It's a great way to kick us off. So now uh, I'm going to go to Mary. Well, um, as um, Phil said, I would like to echo everything he said about the heroism of everybody carrying on through all this very, very peculiar time. Um, so I'm actually de delighted to be taking part. Um, I'm not completely convinced. I know that um, Phillips made this um, distinction between globalism and globalization, and I'm not entirely convinced by that. Um, because I think that um, the two are much more linked and have much more in common than maybe when he tries to separate them. Um, and I have a sort of working thesis here, which is that um, globalism and indeed globalization have been, um, if not destroyed, then very much put on back burner by what's happened with the coronavirus. And I also think, I mean, I agree with Philip that it's a continuation and an exacerbation of trends that were already in existence. Um, but I don't think for that reason um, that um, they should be underestimated. So I think there's three senses in which um, globalism or indeed um, globalization has been affected here. Um, one of them is, I think, in the blindingly obvious, entirely practical um, effort of um, supply chains. Um, I don't think supply chains and this great vision of global trade um, from one end of the earth to the other on a sort of 19th century pattern, um, that I think has been lost for a very, very long time. Um, and one of the reasons is because everybody has discovered that the longer the supply chain, um, the more difficult it is, not just for you as a nation, but for you as a region. Um, and that, in a way, is my hypothesis that um, globalism and globalization may indeed be very severely damaged. But <clears throat> I don't think that applies to regionalism. And I think we could be looking um, in future at a flourishing of regionalism, that that hasn't been destroyed. Um, as well as supply chains, I think on the practical um, aspect of globalization, um, it's not just that um, people will have onshore. In fact, Japan has been onshoring from China for actually a very long time. Um, that trend is obviously going to be continued, um, but it also means that at least as far as Europe is concerned and the United States, to the extent that they have farmed out um, production to cheap labor, especially in China, that is going to be reduced. And what's going to happen with that is that productivity, especially in Europe, is going to have to rise. Probably working conditions are going to have to improve. In the UK, particularly, we're going to have to 
tackle what finally this issue of productivity training and skills which the UK has been so bad at I think that's something that's going to be um, going to be generated and I think that we're going to have to follow you know ironically in a way because of Brexit we're going to have to follow some of the um, continental European patterns of um, labor relations and employees and also um, on the sort of wider element of um, inequality. And the third thing that I think is going to be affected very um, practically is um, the business of migration. I mean, we've seen what's happened in, in the United States, what happens when you've got um, a Trump-like um, isolationist presidency. And I don't think there's any sign that that is actually going to change. Um, and when you look at Europe, I think you're going to have exactly the same trends that there were before which are going to be exacerbated and that will apply particularly to the UK because the UK has been so liberal in its attitude especially to um, low skilled and low paid migration I think that's going to have to change on switching over to regionalism and why I think that regionalism may in part be um, the shape of the future now, a lot of people, and uh, Philip mentioned this, that um, the European Union had been sort of scrambling to, to respond and really hadn't done a very good job of it. I actually disagree because we're not looking here at um, a parallel with the Euro crisis for the European Union. Health was a devolved issue, as it is um, in the UK. And one of the things that the pandemic has shown is it, it's called into question how far um, health can actually be devolved when you've got something that affects everybody in the way it does. Um, but I think that the European Union has actually done quite a good job at two levels. Initially, there was um, quite a lot of um, voluntary help given by the countries that were, that were either handling it better or were, were, were less badly affected, such as Germany and Greece, um, to Spain and Italy, which obviously were so badly affected. This was informal, but it was done in the regional context, in the context of the European Union. And I also think it's far too early to write off the idea of financial help. Um, and I think it's very interesting that the response to talk of a sort of pan-European um, financial package um, has been much less negative, much less divisive than it was over the euro. Um, and I think that's something which is going to set the, um, set the mood for the future. And in some ways, that's actually been helped by the fact that the UK is no longer a member of the European Union. I've seen comments in the last few days that said, well, of course, if, if the UK had been a member, one of the first things it would have done would have been to veto that package. I think we're looking at a new European Union that is potentially um, more um, consolidated and um, more efficient in getting its act together with things like this without Britain than it was with Britain. Um, and I think the third point I would make is that I think um, this actually doesn't bode very well for the UK. We've already seen in three respects how um, the UK has found itself straddled between um, blocks of, and large countries and it looks much more alone now than it did even three months ago and I think we've had three instances of this. Um, one of them was the kerfuffle about um, whether the UK had or had not been invited to take part in a, um, in a European effort um, for PPE, ventilators, etc. Um, whether that was whether that had been decided against politically or not um, and we still actually don't know but that is an issue. Um, the second thing I think is in relation to China because the UK has been much softer, I mean we're not just talking about the United States, it's been much softer than um, 
quite a few European countries and Australia and New Zealand um, in its response to China and its attitudes to China. And we've even seen um, looking at um, the British response to Hong Kong has not been um, either in rhetoric or in practical terms um, of the strongest. In fact, um, the United States has been much stronger for its obviously for its own um, political reasons. But it looks now as though Boris Johnson may be reconsidering the question of Huawei. And of course, attached to that is the UK's great hopes that trade with China will be the sort of beacon um, leading us through Brexit. Um, and I think the hopes for that, are, which already seem to me to be hugely exaggerated, um, now look completely unreal. Um, and the third thing is the British hopes, as it seems, the government's hopes um, of negotiate, of exerting a sort of brinkmanship, partly because of coronavirus, um, with, the, with the European Union and setting terms um, for Brussels to agree to. I mean, it seems to me that is already not happening. Um, and I think we in the UK underestimate how far um, Brussels and the European Union together have moved on. I found it both surprising and quite impressive how united um, the European Union remained right through um, the last two years. Um, and it's also how the Republic of Ireland um, was so strongly aligned and supported um, by the European Union. Um, and I think that um, what, the, what the pandemic is showing is that it's going to be a cold world out there for a country which is a medium-sized country without um, membership of a bigger block and not, not a big country like China or the United States or Russia, which to an extent are regions by themselves. So I'll finish there. Thanks. Thanks, Mary. That was, that was very useful. And I, I think some useful challenges as well, because one of the things about this discussion is there's a, a certain number of assumptions that have been very much become embedded over the past few months. I think like the EU is going to collapse and there's going to be war with China or whatever. So I think it, actually challenging ourselves to see if these are, are, are really the way it's going, I think, I think is a good thing. So let's hope we can come back to that in the discussion. But now I'm going to move on to Morris. Thank you. And to, to reiterate the thanks to the Institute of Ideas, to Mo and to Claire and to you, Alistair, it's, it's, it's great to be in relationship with you and to participate in this. And also to say that with Philip, we were part of the full Brexit together. So it's good to see you, Philip. And Mary, I'm really, really honoured to be, to be with, with you here. Um, so essentially my, my view on the, so Philip, forgive me, but I'm not going to work with the distinction between globalization and globalism. I'm going to just call it globalization uh, for, for the minute um, and, and say that it's been disintegrating for a while. Um, we saw that mostly with Brexit and the Brexit interregnum, that period, which was um, resolved, I, I trace it back really, it's dissolution. Uh, to the crash in 2008, um, and I can I can talk about that um, if you wish. And also to say about the coronavirus, Philip, that I completely agree with you, and it's obviously true that it has no agency, it has no consciousness, and yet it does prey on the underlying conditions or the comorbidities that existed before, and it's doing. That's what's going on. And tonight, really, we're looking at the disintegration of or the international relations um, system and really my point is is that 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 is a long-term uh, process and you could say and my view is that really there was an alliance between western capital and the chinese communist party or you could say the city of london and and chinese communist party um to um exploit a trained workforce um, to disinvest from industry in Britain. This happened in America. What we're seeing is that the United States no longer leads um, or represents the interests of finance capital. It's in a very incoherent and confused position. And you could say that the coronavirus is there preying on its own comorbidities or underlying conditions. 
Um, and, and that's what we're witnessing is the actual disintegration of the fundamental alliance between City of London on the one side, Western capital to get higher rates of return on investment and to and to invest in industry in China and in India and in other areas. But China's perfect because of the impossibility or the illegality of forming uh, any free and independent trade unions. I mean, from the establishment of the ILO in 1919, the, independent, the International Labour Organization, but particularly when it was rolled over into the UN, China has always refused to ratify the clause in that that would recognize freedom of association of free and independent trade unions. So it was perfect for capital because you could have a system where there was no independent representation, whatever, of the workforce or of labor. And the key to globalization is the domination of capital in relation to labor. And that's what we've lived through I've, my whole life is the disintegration of the labor movement, the disintegration of social democracy, the inability for any form of democracy to resist it. Um, we've seen that throughout the private sector, the deindustrialization de of the North and of the, and of the Midlands. And so this story about globalization really is the story that we've been living through. And that's what was at stake in Brexit. Was globalization better mediated through membership of the EU or was it through the restoration of the nation state? The decision was made last December so what I see with the coronavirus, um, Philip, in a way, is just the continuation of those things and, and their intensification. And what you have now is, is and Mary is completely right to say, that there's no coherent vision whatever of Britain and, and, and where, where we are in this. So I work within the Labour tradition and I work within therefore a tradition of internationalism where there should be forms of solidarity and all forms of solidarity certainly in relation to labor but also in relation to liberty and the right to free and independent trade unions um and so i think that this moment actually is a moment that we should be reflecting on what is our constructive alternative in what way is internationalism capable of expressing an alternative vision of an international order to that of globalization, which I see as the free movement of capital, the absolute dominion of capital um, in terms of its investment decisions and frictionless trade, this idea um, that goods and services move. And obviously my analysis of the EU, and I don't want to get too bogged down, is that it went from being a very effective social democratic, Christian democratic organization it's in its inception to essentially a Hayekian organization that subordinated democracy utterly to, to treaty law. So th there is a pressing uh, need for a constructive alternative. And what you see going on with China, I think is, is very important, is that it's no longer Russia that is the enemy here. There's no longer Russia where there's the polarization. It certainly is is China and that's taking all manner of forms and I think that's going to that is because the key alliance that underpinned globalization was precisely between China and Western capital and then the EU and all Western governments when China was accepted into the um, WTO um, under Clinton you could say that new Labour and the new Democrats really bet everything um, on this and what you see as Philip rightly mentioned was the decimation of the Rust Belt, the decimation of our own industry and then this very surprising return from the point of view that saw globalization as inevitable of the nation state, the recognition we're going through um, during this period of the necessity and importance of the working class and this hasn't happened in my lifetime, the recognition of cleaners, shelf stackers, truck drivers, um, it's quite an astonishing thing here in Hackney, they actually socially distantly applaud the bus drivers when they come out of the bus depot. I've never seen the like of it. Um, but there is a recognition that it's non-fungible, that labor is human, human in form, non-fungible and necessary. Um, and then there's the importance, which Mary quite rightly drew attention to, the importance of place. And suddenly, you know, what they call there's always buzzwords, supply chains are the order of the day. You know, I say workers of the world unite, you've got nothing to lose your supply 
actions, but what we feel is vulnerable, very vulnerable, and then a production of, of basic national self sufficiency in terms of necessities that is transforming the domestic, but it's also feeding in this idea of China. So I know that I'm probably running out of of time. What I would say in relation to Mary is, is that the EU has been transformed here. The borders are up. The ECB is no longer in control in terms of finance. There's, there's a, it's quite transformed in that regard. And we have to have some constructive alternatives. So that's what I'd like to, uh, to finish on. And to say that there's a moment here where, where Britain and Labour in particular, should start articulating um, a position that first of all, in any free trade deal that we do, there has to be a reciprocal agreement to free and democratic trade unions, that Labour is what is at stake in globalisation and the status of Labour. Uh, and we have to make it, we have to at least articulate a position that is not about built on capital being able to move to, in order to exploit cheap Labour wherever it can that there should be some framework that free and democratic trade unions are, are non-negotiable. I think that there's a moment here, Mary, I'm really interested to know what you think about where we could actually meaningfully start to talk about a peace with Russia. That's a, obviously the EU was a Cold War institution. Russia has labor traditions and uh, that were pre-revolutionary labor traditions, but nonetheless um, held and indigenous to Russia. Uh, Russia is extremely threatened by China. It's a very marginal economy. It's been sidelined by the Silk Road. I think Britain, outside the EU, has position to to start genuinely um, talking to Russia and and seeing if it's possible to heal that divide. I think that that will bring a lot of Northern Europe into line on that if it can be built around free and democratic trade unions, and that could change the dynamics uh, very much. I think also I'm going to bring you to a halt at this point. There we go. Also. Is that okay? I, I don't think we can come back to, to some there of the other stuff that you're going to say. I want to make about Ireland. So yeah. you know, the can, of can we come back to that in the discussion? Because oh. I think if we can get through the, the, the introductions, then we can start to knit it together into a, in, into right. a discussion. So I want, I want to go to Joan now. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for the Academy. Thanks, Alistair. Um, I think the coronavirus pandemic will change things in three important ways. It will bring to the surface developments that had previously largely gone unnoticed, such as the way in which China has already established spheres of influence in parts of the world that receive little attention in general, in Eastern Europe, Africa, Latin America, and so on. It will act as an accelerant of existing geopolitical trends in particular, the rivalry between the US and China, and also the shift in the economic balance of power from the West to the East. And finally, I think it will, well, the pandemic and the fallout from the policies adopted in response to it will be a catalyst uh, for changes that are presently difficult to predict um, in the developed and the developing world. Uh, so for example, the future of the EU and relations between EU member states, I think will be changed by this. Um, the relationship between many developing countries and China also. I, I just wanna focus on, on four points. Um, the first one is um, how this crisis will accelerate the shift in the economic balance of power from the West to the East. Um, it will take time to see the full impact of the crisis on countries and also the shape of the recovery, but there's little doubt that it's going to have a differential impact in different parts of the world uh, for several reasons. First of all, because the starting positions uh, in the East and the West were very different going into this uh, crisis. So Western advanced economies had already been experiencing years of sluggish growth, low productivity, were overly debt dependent. Um, the strains were already beginning to show before COVID-19. Uh, remember the discussion about Germany last year. By contrast, Eastern economies were growing much faster, enjoying rising prosperity based on expanding value production. 
in response to the crisis, Western countries have adopted whatever it takes, monetary and fiscal policies, and they may limit the damage from the crisis, uh, but this unprecedented borrowing and the accumulation of debt that may stave off depression for a while, but it's not going to fix the underlying problems of productivity and profitability um, here in the West. Um, China and Asian economies have also been hit hard by the lockdowns and um, the damage to export markets from collapsing demand in the West, but their starting positions were better. They benefit from much more dynamic business investment, innovation, productivity growth, and so they're strongly placed for a um, a, a, a bounce back or better place or a bounce back. So I think what we'll see in the post-crisis uh, uh, recovery stage is growth rates in different parts of the world, world will accelerate this continued rebalancing of the world economy and this long-term shift in economic power from the West to the East. So that's the first point. The second point is that China is likely to emerge from this crisis in, as a bigger global player. Uh, in political terms as well. Now, it's not all going to be plain sailing uh, for China by any means, um, but we've already seen that China will use every opportunity to push itself forward in a leadership role, um, especially in a situation in which the US has not acted as a global leader, allowing China actually to step up, which may seem counterintuitive given um, how, how this all started. Um, now, this retreat of the US on the, as a kind of global uh, uh, player on the global stage was already in train before COVID-19, uh, indeed before the Donald Trump presence, presidency as well. But what's striking now is the US's failure to lead a global response to the pandemic when it ought to as the global hegemon. Um, I mean, it's hardly led a federal response, some would say. Um, and the failure to do so obviously undermines America's standing in the world and how others see it. And it's allowed China to, um, uh, to, 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 to fill this vacuum uh, to some degree, despite the initial bundling of the outbreak in Wuhan um, and the lack of transparency and so on. China subsequently has tried to repair the damage and sought to promote itself as a responsible, collaborative and helpful uh, global partner. Third point, US-China uh, um, rivalry um, is going to intensify now. It's already become much more open just in the, the past uh, few months. Uh, and, it's, and, and in the short term, this is only going to, to get worse. And that's because of this increasingly stark uh, mismatch between the economic and political power. Um, that's becoming increasingly obvious and China resents that intensely um, and you know, there's been many examples of that until now. So in the short term, I think, you know, we, we, the, the, we're going to see a deterioration in relations. It's likely to be at the forefront of the US um, pre, uh, presidential election campaign, um, China bashing that is, um, and that could cause uh, lasting uh, damage. But I think the really important question is over the long term and what is the, and what is unclear is what the US policy will be. Is the US policy one of containment or of finding ways to accommodate China uh, into the global order, i.e. is it going to be decoupling or a new sort of bipolarity or accommodation? Um, and, you know, and can, it be, can that be managed in a non- conflictual uh, way. Um, I think the bottom line is that the US is going to seek to prolong its global, global domination. China will challenge that. Um, it wants a new kind of, of bipolarity um, and it, that's what it's been pushing for for a long time now. And I think that, um, that is going to intensify in the coming period. Um, the final point um, I want to make is about how this um, unraveling, if you like, of the post-world global order and this increasing rivalry creates problems and, and also opportunities uh, for others. So in particular, what we see is rising tensions within the Western camp, especially in the transatlantic relationship. Again, something that preceded COVID-19, indeed preceded um, Donald Trump's presidency, but obviously has worsened over the past few years. We also see in China's backyard as well, 
uh, tensions uh, rising there, reaction to China's growing dominance and assertiveness and so on. That's creating all sorts of conflicts um, there in its own backyards. But just to focus on um, perhaps on Europe uh, a little bit and to say, you know, make a few points about that. So um, in response to uh, this kind of US withdrawal and the perceived threat from China, um, and uh, over the past few years, various European leaders, most prominently President Macron of France, has called for a more assertive EU uh, and emphasised the need for economic sovereignty. So the idea is that the EU could position itself um, as a sort of third power between uh, the US and China. Now, for the uh, for self-preservation purposes, that is absolutely necessary. Um, you know, the the EU cannot allow the US as over the Iran um, uh, uh, treaty, for example, or China um, in terms of takeovers or, or, or and, and Belt and Road and so on, to walk all over it, to trample all over you. Uh, but whether it's feasible for the EU um, to, to do that is another matter um, altogether. Um, now, I, I know we all need to be careful uh, not to see what we want to see but I do find it hard to recognise Mary's description of what's been happening uh, in the EU in recent months. I mean, this is a region that, yeah, uh, I, I'm sure we are all of us looking at very uh, closely. But I think the response, uh, it's, sim it's simply put, I think, first of all, EU has these pretensions to superpower status, but it's very far from being able to realize those or indeed to project power like obviously uh, not like the China or the US but not even like Russia for that matter it's not even capable of projecting power in the way that Russia does um, and I think it's too divided um, to be able to do it and the response to the pandemic has actually exposed the limitations of the EU um, and its divisions and dysfunction and so on um, you know borders have closed um, there's been bans on the um, medical supplies going to other EU member states and peripheral um, uh, countries on the borders of, of the EU. The nation state was back with a vengeance and the EU was nowhere. And even now, months after the crisis began, uh, the EU has not agreed um, a, 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 a pandemic recovery uh, package. Um, there's been very small sums put forward. And what we've seen is increasing acrimony actually um, between east and west, north and south. Um, this package that is now put forward after the Franco-German proposal by the European Commission, um, I mean we're talking about something that's going to come into existence perhaps um, next year. I mean the whole, it's, it's very likely to be very small sums in terms of what is needed, too little um, and too, too late. And Joel, there is a I, building gonna... backlash uh, against it from the so-called frugal states, you know, who've come to prominence um, uh, in the Hanseatic League since the departure of the UK. So it's very likely that it's going to be watered, ground, watered down and we're going to see more of the same sort of uh, acrimony and wrangling. Uh, John, I'm going to bring you to a halt there. because. Good. That seems like a natural point to pause. So um, thanks to everyone. I think some very useful uh, stuff in all of the, a lot of stuff in those introductions and some very useful uh, stuff as well. Um, we might want to look at Phil's delineation between the globalism and globalization. We might want to try and understand a bit more about uh, the exact form that these uh, rivalries are going to take. We might usefully, I think, question whether it is you know, the end of the EU, whether the US is necessarily a failed state, what's going to happen in, in terms of the battles ahead with China. Um, I'm going to come straight out to the audience, though, rather than uh, come to the speakers. So if you want to speak, you need to go to the participants panel and find the raise hand button and put your hand up. I'm going to take people broadly in the order that they come in. So first up, Alan, uh, I'm going to bring you in now and I'm unmuting you now. So off you go. Uh, well, listening to Joan was like a, a breath of fresh air. Uh, I, I think it was uh, pretty marvellous. Um, I think just to elaborate on a, a, a couple of the points, I think what she suggested was that everything has happened much more rapidly after 2008-9 when the balance between the political and the economic disjunctures became apparent. And all the coronavirus has done is to, I think she used the word, catalyzed the 
emerging antagonisms in the world order. So if we look at it very quickly from the Chinese and the American perspective, yes, the Chinese had a lack of transparency and they've tried to translate that into soft power, but we should also bear in mind that they will suffer extreme problems in terms of their debt diplomacy in Africa, if it goes badly in Africa. And we should also bear in mind the incoherence of US foreign policy. But looking at it from the Chinese perspective, what's happened is that the time scale has accelerated. In 1991, Deng made the point that they should just basically keep quiet until the economic conditions of the world changed. But you can no longer do that after 2007, eight. Uh, and then you can now see the much more, um, I hesitate to use the word wolf diplomacy in Hong Kong, Taiwan, and in the South Asia. But this is also a response to the fact that domestic issues in China are not going their way, and they need that level of uh, foreign aggressiveness. And this links into something which has not been mentioned, which is very important in the Chinese context, is the end of the century of humiliation, that China has to come back to a role that it played previously and to try and compensate for the increasing lack of legitimacy of the party. And also, and I think um, bearing in mind the points that, that, that Joan raised in relationship to Southeast Asia, is that there is a lot of hostility, even in their immediate regional environment. The Vietnamese call it talk and take diplomacy. And the one very minor point I disagree with with Joan, and this is crucial for the way that it might turn out, is the lack of innovation in the Chinese economy, the lack of creativity as a result of the constricted authoritarian nature. So if we then turn to the United States, the United States still has huge advantages in terms of its demography, it's a much younger population, it's still much more productive in the key sectors of the soft economy. The real problem for the United States, as which has been evidenced unfortunately and tragically in the last few days, is the lack of internal coherence in their own society, their lack of trust in their own society. But let's not overestimate the fact that whether there's a lot of trust in, the, in Chinese society. Most Chinese people do not believe the party, but they have no way of expressing it at the moment. And also the incoherence, of, I mean, the absolute stupidity uh, of the lack of um, alignment with the Trans-Pacific project. Back to China, they see themselves encircled. So there is a real conflict here which is emerging and there's nobody who really seems to be able to, to get to grips with it. There will be a regional fragmentation. There will be the domination of the renminbi in Southeast Asia, um, parallel to the way that the German currency uh, partly dominates Northern Europe and perhaps with the same consequences. And I think that I also, and I'll conclude with this, many other points, I'll also conclude with the point that Joe raised in relation to the European Union. If you read any European Union document on its relationship with China, it's basically bleating at the fact that they're not taken any notice of by China, because China is interested in German manufacturing, although German business is less interested in it now. It's interested in UK financial services, which is a potential problem. It's interested in Northern Italian family businesses, and it would buy Greece. Okay, thanks very much, Alan. So I'm going to bring JJ in now. Just very briefly, I guess um, the uh, one kind of uh, a line through all, all the contributions is, uh, that seems to me to make the most important sense is the issue that Joan certainly touched upon, which is the imbalance of productivity and the difference in a very stagnant West, which has been stagnant economically for a very long time, and, and an East, in particular China, which has a certain uh, dominance in that. And um, it, it strikes me that, you know, uh, much as we might talk about uh, what to do and what to kind of look, uh, try to kind of uh, uh, push for uh, in the next uh, year, uh, two years, you know, in terms of uh, an economic, economic vision, it's really striking that in the West, or certainly in the UK, uh, the one thing that the one uh, already existing tendency that COVID has brought out in political discourse and thinking is simply to reinforce uh, the, te the tendency to think about uh, the only economic alternative after COVID being the Green New Deal. Uh, so it's really extraordinary to see how low uh, the horizons of the thinking are uh, is around uh, what to do with the economy. I mean, there's been lots of talk slowly emerging about having to deal with productivity, having to do with a new industrial policy and so on. And 
and people are paying lip service to it. But in reality, what's up, the only thing that's happened out of COVID is a, a kind of attempt to uh, force through and install a mentality that will accept the, the essential kind of managed austerity of Green New Deal economic thinking. Um, uh, and that's really not a substitute for uh, anything uh, progressive or, 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 or uh, developmental. So I, I'm, I'm curious to know from the speakers how that kind of uh, lack of imagination or that very, very lo low level of ambition uh, really is going to translate, uh, you know, is refracted in, in some of these discussions because none of them have really touched upon it. But it seems to me that the, that the imagination or level of thinking about uh, really pushing forwards and bouncing back hard, as it were, to try and deal with the, the, the trouble that, that COVID has, has produced is simply not not there. So I'd like to hear some some thoughts about how that kind of that kind of uh, cultural and intellectual um, uh, lack of uh, ambition is going to translate into the way in which these these other trends uh, work through. Okay, thanks, JJ. So I'm going to bring in Mehdi now. Thank you very much. I'll try to be brief. Philip made a gallant effort to distinguish between globalism and globalization, but he did actually leave me slightly struggling at the end of his, uh, his argument. But it, the one point that he raised that with the tide of globalism receding, that could actually increase the scope for democracy in the, in the countries. And the two countries that he cited, the UK and the United States, the evidence does not bode well. In the last year, in the United States, and the effort to, to, to isolate itself, hence uh, to, to push back uh, uh, global institutions. We actually see rule by decree in the way that much is happening with executive orders in the United States and trying to circumvent the Congress is essentially ruled not only by one party, perhaps by one man. And when you look at the United Kingdom, those who actually were at the forefront of the Brexit, the party and the, and the, and the uh, section within the party, wanted to actually prorogue parliament for, for more than five years, for six weeks or so. And then we had a recent debacle last week with respect to how we are going now to be governed with the globalism pushed back. Uh, that, that does not square well with the argument that we put forward with respect to the rebirth or the re resurgence of democracy if we actually see the institutions, the global institutions, uh, uh, taking the back seat. Okay, thanks. So Daniel, I'm going to come to you now. So hopefully you're unmuted. Off you go. I mean, just in relation to the European Union, I mean, I'm generally a fan of uh, Mary's writing, but I found her claims on the EU being strengthened by the crisis just extraordinary. I should say that in, in a previous forum, I've criticised over-enthusiastic Brexiteers who thought that the EU would just spontaneously collapse as a result of the crisis, because I don't think that's true. I think the European elites are still very committed to the European Union. But having said that, I think it's had a very bad crisis so far. Uh, things Joan started to allude to, so borders reasserted themselves, uh, end of free movement, strictures on state aid, you know, key rules within the European Union uh, suspended, uh, strictures on fiscal limits, how much each country can spend, uh, again suspended. A complete failure to get corona bonds off the ground, which is a kind of mutualised bonds jointly issued by all the different EU member states. Hasn't happened. One thing that's really been played down, but I think is very important, which is that the German Constitutional Court, which is a key player in German politics, the Bundesverfassungsgericht, uh, has basically said in a kind of roundabout way that German sovereignty is still important. And this is, you know, the key, the, maybe the core state in the uh, European Union still saying we need to, to some extent, have some kind of sovereignty. 
as I said, that's being played down, but I think that was in the judgment, as far as I can see. And finally, this package, it's not a package, it's a proposal for start. Uh, it's a proposal which, as Joan said, will almost certainly be watered down hugely. It's very, very small in the, I mean, so, you know, 750 billion euros, but in the scheme of things, that is very small, spread out over several years over many, many different countries. So it seems to me it's already clear that the EU has been really frayed and weakened by the crisis, which is not to say that it will spontaneously disappear. Just one final thing on the Green New Deal and the Green Recovery. Uh, I think it's going to make matters worse, but uh, far worse, but hopefully I'll be talking about that in a future economy forum. I, won't, I know Alistair won't let me talk about it now, so uh, I'll stop there. Okay, thanks Daniel. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take Dominic and Hillary next for some uh, quick contributions. Then I'm going to come back to the panel and just ask each of the panel for about a minute's worth of responses to anything that they want that's been raised so far. Then we've got quite a number of hands going out, so I'm going to come back out again and, and uh, get another round of questions. So Dominic, off you go. Uh, good evening. Um, I just wanted to kind of ask a question to the speakers at the extent to which they think that the disintegration of globalism and globalization will create opportunities for China uh, to take advantage of this. I'm speaking as a Brit living in Italy, and I wonder whether both the UK and, the, and Italy are kind of cherries that China might have the potential to pick off. So I agree very much with um, Morris's points on borders and Daniel's points um, on a lot of kind of national uh, solutions. If we look at the EU recovery fund, uh, if it happens, it represents 0.6% of EU GDP over four years. As Joan says, it will come very late and it will come too late, particularly for Italy. Now, as the restrictions on the ECB take effect uh, in relation to the decision of the German Constitutional Court, will it be the case that a country like Italy remains unsupported by the ECB uh, and other EU mechanisms? It has very uh, high levels of Chinese investment. Uh, it signed the Belt and Road Initiative. Is there the potential there for as the EU fails to support a country like Italy and the debt crisis mounts for Italy to develop stronger ties with China. Uh, as the Brexit negotiations also develop, we will see national differences, particularly over things like fishing rights. Will the EU uh, be able to respond to that? And will China actually also uh, develop a different relationship with the UK? So my question to the speakers are, you know, will China be able to kind of pick off as globalism and globalization disintegrate? Okay, thanks very much, Dominic. So Hillary, you're on now. Yes, uh, yes. so can I uh, ask about what seems to be very confusing, which is the distinction between financial markets, which actually seem to me to be as, as globalized as, as they've ever been. There's so much capital sloshing around, uh, leaving aside kind of China's seem seemingly trying to delineate a kind of local equity market from a, an international equity market. But there's loads of money uh, sloshing around internationally in, in financial markets, which are more and more and more disconnected from the real economy. I, I cannot have any explanation of where uh, uh, financial stock markets are uh, at the moment. But that seems to be very different to the kind of real economy where there does seem to be lots more attempts at protectionism and inward lookingness. And it just seems to be those two things work very opposite. And you can almost see there's um, a disintegration of globalism in real economies, but the opposite in financial um, markets. Okay, thanks, uh, Hilary. So I'm going to come back now to the panel for just uh, some fairly quick thoughts on anything that you want to pick up. I mean, some, some questions have been directed uh, directly, or points have been directed at you, uh, or there might be other stuff that you want to pick on. So if I come to Mary first, uh, Mary, do you just want to pick up on one, at most two things? Um, I'd like to pick, pick up on two and a half things. Um, the half thing is just a slight um, warning across 
China, because I think there is a general assumption that China is on a sort of perpetual rise one way or another. And I think one of the things that we may be looking at very, very quickly is the possibility of um, maybe a short war or maybe something worse between China and India, which seems to be brewing on their frontier. Um, but also that the the assumption that China is going to remain a stable country. I think that's, I think looking ahead five, 10 years, um, I would be quite cautious about that. Um, just look at, you know, how is the Communist Party going to lose power? Is it going to lose power? What sort of state organizations are there going to be? Um, I'm not sure that China is as stable or as monolithic as it looks. That's the half point. Um, I was You're only going to have time for one more. Okay. I, 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 was my foot taken, down now. I was generally taken to task on the EU, um, to which I would only say, um, let's wait and see. It seems to me that there is much less serious dissension um, over coronavirus than there was over the euro, and that the arguments are less institutional um, than they were then. Also, that the, the business of putting up borders is less um, definitive than it looked during the migration crisis, which was overcome. So I would just um, wait and see a bit for that. I think that um, the, the EU's desire to stay together is going to be much, much greater than to fall apart. Okay, uh, Phil, if I come to you now. Pick up on something, so thanks um, for all the comments. I wanted to pick up on something that Hillary said at the end and uh, to underscore um, something I said in my opening remarks about the fact that um, globalization is a set of processes which tug in different directions. So to clarify that, so for instance, the um, historian Adam Tews has made a point about this. He says in this kind of age when everyone's talking about the reassertion of the nation state, um, the collapse of all these global supply chains, about reshoring industry, there are two things that are global, which is the um, Federal Reserve, the US Central Bank, and the virus. And this is what's striking about the process um, that's happened in, the, in response to the corona crisis, is that the role of the, of the Central Reserve has been strengthened, it's been expanded, and it's taken a much, it's effectively become the lender of last resort for the planet as a whole. And there is no political um, structure that corresponds to the enhanced globalized role of the Federal Reserve and of the dollar as a reserve currency for the rest of the world. So this idea that um, the nation state has been um, boosted and that we can, you know, will respond by raising our borders and engaging in protectionism. At the end of the day, we're all, all the Western states effectively at their core, they've got a central bank, which is plugged in and dependent on the US Federal Reserve. So this has in fact been strengthened as a result of what's happened with the corona pandemic. So globalization isn't something which has simply been um, reversed or is simply halted as a result of corona, but in some ways has been exacerbated and expanded. So this is the point I would say, um, and I'll leave it here, is to say that um, we're still stuck with the legacy of the 19th century and the legacy of modernity, which is to say that our political systems are nation-based and separate and our economic system is global. And Corona isn't going to destroy the global economy. As I say, in some ways, it's actually strengthened the financial interlinkages which underpin globalization. That contradiction isn't going to go away. And the question for politics is how to manage that contradiction, um, not as to the idea that it could be overcome or that globalization is going to evaporate and we're all going to fall back into autarkic national economies. OK, thanks, Phil. Um, Joan, I'm going to come to you next. Yeah, to come back on um, the points that Alan made um, about the US, um, it's a point I would have made with if I'd had the time. Um, I agree, absolutely. I think the US still has cards to play. I think there is a tendency, especially on the left, to write off the US or to underestimate uh, the US. And, you know, to talk about the US being a failed state, I think that goes far, much too far. The US is certainly in trouble in many respects. Um, but I wouldn't go, I don't think it's anywhere near being a failed state and it's still got a lot to fall back on and not just in terms of as a military power and, you know, in terms of its 
uh, being the leading military power in the even in the foreign policy and diplomacy sphere it's still um, uh, you know, has this kind of tremendous accumulation of experience and reach in the economic sphere. Obviously, it's tradition of entrepreneurship, innovation, uh, investment in R&D, its strengths in certain sectors. Um, you know, it's way ahead of uh, the Europe, for example, and always has been. The EU is, uh, is not going to catch up. Um, so there's still strengths there. And even politically, dare I say it, despite all its problems, you know, there's still there, uh, it still is uh, a, a commitment to uh, freedom and democracy, which is the, you know, in the end, no matter how sullied and weakened and, and it, it is um, and has become, um, that is an advantage still over China, which, you know, by definition, the China does not have a model that is exportable. So that's why it's, um, it's very difficult for China even to build it as a regional hegemon, you know, why you get this talk and take response from Vietnam and, and, and others in, in, in its own backyard. Anyway, that, that's just on the US. The final point is on the globalization question. So I don't know if I'm misinterpreting what Phil, Philip was saying. Um, you know, I think maybe he was trying to make a distinction between uh, globalization or internationalization in terms of world trade, FDI, movement of capital and, 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 and goods and, 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 and uh, investment and so on, and globalism as a political creed of um, global elites, um, which is um, embraced in counterposition or as opposed to belief in the nation state as the bedrock of um, organization and democracy. Now, there's no doubt that this uh, process uh, is not just a, a debate. It's not just that there's a backlash against globalization. There has been deglobalization already. So if you just look in terms of growth in global trade, um, from 1990 to 2008, growth in global trade was twice that of growth of GDP. Since 2008, um, that relationship has been reversed. So we've already seen a kind of process of a rolling back of globalization. There's been lots of other changes as well in terms of supply chains and where they've moved and regionalization and so on. Um, but um, there's no doubt that this backlash will gather pace. It's been going on for some time. I don't think we're going to see a complete you know, rollback or reversal of, of the international division of labor in any major way, but there's no doubt, I think, that, that uh, we're going to, the, the appetite for autarky, for self-sufficiency in certain areas is, is there, and it, that is going to result in important changes, um, okay. and, and maybe in the growth of regionalization to some degree as well. Okay, thanks, John. So if I just bring Morris in now. Um, just say uh, I really hugely appreciate all the contributions. I'm gonna speak very quickly. Um, to, to Alan and JJ, I, I really appreciate that, particularly the patheticness of the Green New Deal. Um, but how are we going to uh, have a space to develop a, a different form of national economy is, is central there. I mean, for example, in August, I reckon uh, 40 of our universities are going to be declared bankrupt. You know, they're just going to be, because they are the ultimate symbol of this global economy, the, the knowledge economy, foreign students, I mean, I would argue that they should be closed and turned into vocational colleges, you know, and that should be a, a, an active part of the strategy. And, and, it, and in terms of Hillary, which is a really long point to, to respond to, but the way that the City of London functions independently of the national economy has got to be addressed. So capital centralises every bit as much as the state none of the regional building societies exist anymore as local institutions. Access to capital is minimal in the faraway towns. I would say that there should be a Tobin tax on the city of London in order to fund regional banks that can actually bring capital to the areas that are denuded of capital. Um, loads of other things to Daniel, I say, Bonacera, there has to be some alliance uh, around what Joan was talking about, that that democracy and liberty are fundamental things and must feed into innovation and productivity. That's the coalitions that we need to build. 
Okay, thanks, Morris. So we've got a lot of hands, uh, so a lot of people to get in, but not a huge amount of time left. So I think we're going to have to speed up the, the contributions a little bit. I'm going to take Alfie and then Peter, then Ella, who's my co-host. Uh, so Alfie, off you go. Okay, yeah, so my question was for Morris. Uh, you talk about providing an alternative to uh, globalisation, but looking inwards here into sort of the UK uh, political space, uh, is there space for that when we have two political parties that seem to be globalization at all costs? And also, do you think that this uh, crisis has sort of invoked a paradigm shift for the working classes here in the UK? Okay, thanks, Alfie. So, Peter. Okay, um, two questions quickly. The first one is really going back to the last point. Uh, it seems to me that... Um, um, Johnson seems to have a very globalist view of the Brexit, you know, which might make sense. I don't know. Perhaps that fits in the trend away from um, um, away from globalisation. The other thing is, if you look at um, the internet, which is very important, Netflix, um, 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 or, 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 or all the major things, or, 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 or the major platforms, they seem to be very globalist. So, how does that fit in from that point of view? At least, we seem to be becoming more and more globalist. Okay. Thanks, Peter. Um, Ella. It's just a point about, more really about how publics are reacting to this or the, the tone of the way in which people are perceiving the discussion about um, globalism. I mean, the, just as a funny point in relation to the EU and how it's managed this crisis, I mean, it's been really uh, enjoyable reading the several articles that have been written about how great female leaders are and how they're tackling this crisis better than male leaders and everyone's sort of... <laughs> awkwardly sweat when you bring up the question of Merkel and von der Leyen who have sort of been um, you know lambasted and shamed about their uh, response to Italy and you know at a time when hospital beds were piling up and there was a huge amount of deaths there they were sort of tight-fisted and so that's that that's been significant but more broadly I mean the interesting thing especially in relation to the UK is it wasn't so long ago that you know talking about things like national spirit patriotism um, a sense of place, you know, all those discussions we had about Brexit were sort of dirty words. And now you're, we're in, it feels like you're in this very different landscape. I mean, just to kind of maybe perhaps challenge Phil slightly in terms of that the coronavirus hasn't affected this at all. I think one thing it might have affected is in a positive way, it can, it, 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 you're not really able to as a sort of, um, in a sort of shallow liberal way, cheerlead for the EU and cheerlead internationalism because it, it doesn't work in this new context, I don't think, anymore. But the one way in which I am worried about it is when the discussion about climate change comes in, because I think that's a very real way in which a, uh, you know, basically a, a sort of blanket approach to saying we can't have any kind of sense of nation state, this has to be an international problem and it has to be taken out of the hands of, of publics um, comes in. So that's a, that's a minefield. Okay, um, so I'm going to come to David now. So um, I've, I've like got a couple of thoughts on that, like which uh, I just thought to share. Like I, I know Morris and that, like in a, was it, I, I'm ex-military, so people like wonder why I've talked the way that I do with this is why I like. So it's our society is weak. Uh, culturally, weakness is encouraged. Strength and competence is not. It's not politically. Uh, we're more concerned about you know making numbers on a balance sheet add up than solving any real problems. That's just the general the general thing that I seem to feel. Um, Britain should be a fortress. It should be reached for source independent. It should be environmentally sustainable, developing its skill and technology to become resistant to the influence of foreign power, disease, famine, and the law of scarcity driven resource wars. We need to change our industry, directing it towards solving real problems of housing, renewable energy, materials technology, hemp, for example. We need to change what our military is, make it a more, more geared towards civil defence, guerrilla warfare, make it more useful, so that it could actually defend Britain, but actually be more, more actually relevant to what we need. The education system needs to change. It should be geared up towards addressing societal needs and attacking these real problems instead of being a compliance exercise that beats out critical thinking delivers re and delivers no real usable skills out of the gate. Scarcity, if scarcity breeds value, we need to work towards hyperlocalization, 
and be prepared to suffer to achieve it, you know, for, for long-term strength. And the problem with our society is that everybody wants everything to be easy now. And, it, and, and we should be thinking about how we're going to survive in the future. So I don't know if anybody wants to got anything to comment on that. Oh, okay. Thanks, thought. David. Thanks, David. Um, so I'm going to come to Alec and then Phil Mullen. Then I'm going to come quickly back to the panel and take just a few very brief thoughts. And then I'll come back out for a final round. And everybody who's got their hand up, I'll, I'll, I'll take. So Alec, uh, you go now. Hi, I hope you can hear me. Yes. Yes. Uh, my question is uh, to Philip, to what he said at the very beginning. He said that he talked about uh, the opportunity to reboot uh, globalization on a more uh, democratic basis, he said. Isn't that a, a bit of uh, sort of, uh, with all due respect, a bit of uh, a desire to having our cake and eat it? Wouldn't you agree that the whole, uh, that the whole way this uh, global system will work is that it is not uh, democratic and once we try to introduce uh, elements of democracy the it would uh, it, it would cease to perform its intended function so uh, it, just a thought okay thanks uh, alec uh, phil thanks to uh, the panel excellent uh, excellent discussion um, a lot of identification which i share of disintegration tendencies divisions and so on particularly the way joan presented it but one of the things that really or two of the things that really struck me of what's happened in response to the pandemic is how quickly um, a couple of political stances or perspectives have solidified. I mean, they existed before, true, but the way they've com consolidated, I think, is, is, is very striking and also potentially uh, pretty dangerous. The first is China bashing, uh, and the second is the support for autarkic policies. Because what's happened uh, in the space of just a few weeks Discussions which were pending, you know, or which could be identified, say, on China bashing was seen as something the Americans were pushing off and identified with Trump and trade wars and tariff wars and so on. But in the space of a few weeks, just there are really no Western countries and Western elites which have not signed up to China being the problem. I mean, they, they, they've, they've all signed up to the idea that China somehow aggravated this at least in terms of the pandemic but it's very quickly tied in with all the themes which existed before in terms of the liberalism that existed in China and so on and that consensus which unites I think the, the sort of the, the the insular nationalists as you can call them and the globalists are still very much there I don't quite agree on, on Philip saying they've disintegrated they're very much there but it's it's brought them together in a consensus in a very fast way which I think is, is very very striking the second is the support for autarky uh, and those policies, which again is something which in the past was seen as identified with the insular nationalists and so on, you know, that they were in favor of tariffs and, and, and protectionist policies. Actually, for a long time, it's the globalists have also been pushing protectionism. But I say what's solidified just in the last few weeks is how um, the, 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 the goals of resilience and self-sufficiency have now become normalized and accepted across the political spectrum within the elites. So those two stances, which have uh, come to the fore, come to the surface so quickly, uh, seems to me to be very dangerous. You know, Ch bashing China, very confrontationist, not any help to the Chinese people who are fighting for the democracy in their own way, and the autarkic policies, which are uh, potentially very divisive within the West. So I, I, if the, I know the panel are coming back, I mean, it'd be interesting to hear, uh, because several of the panel members have talked about the need for a democratic, nation-based internationalism, just how you approach these two... Uh, uh, these two stances of China bashing, how we, how we take a stance against that, how you deal with that, and how you deal with the self-sufficiency, sensible arguments that have been put for the need for a target policy. Okay, thanks, uh, Phil. So um, I'm going to come back to the panel now, just for one point at the most, because I do want to come out for a, a, another round of questions. So if I come to Morris first this time. Okay, I'll, I'll be as quick as I can, but I'll defy you, Alistair, and I'll answer... Uh, two. The first is to say to, to Alfie, I think it's important there's a space in Blue Labour that we're discussing it. I put my email up on the chat, please be in touch, but I'll leave it there. But I think there is a big change going on and it's very important there. And then, and then to, to Phil, just, just straightforwardly, um, globalisation meant the dominion of capital. What has happened is the abandonment of a huge number of regions. So this discussion about the balance between autarky self-sufficiently, it's obvious to people that we're incapable of satisfying the most basic needs. 
at the moment. So that's one thing. The other thing about about China is is the point I was trying to raise is that there is something important to bash there, and that and that is the disintegration of society and the complete do domination of the market and the state. So I, I'll leave it there. But there, there's good reasons why they just haven't come in the last six weeks, and there's got to be a meaningful political conversation about an economic settlement. I was trying to say to JJ and Alan earlier that it that is that is built around some notion of being able to provide the most necessities within our national economy. Okay, Mary next, and then I'll come to Joan and Philip. Okay, I'll see how far I get with single sentences. Um, David, I agree absolutely with you about the need for a reorientation of the British military. Um, and I think this is one of the reasons why the top brass is currently so apprehensive about the comprehensive review um, which is going to be held through the rest of this year and I think into next year because they think that their wings are going to be clipped in exactly that direction. Um, I agree with Joan on the question of um, there's still life in the United States um, and its political system. Um, and I think one of the most interesting things about the Trump presidency is how far um, Trump has pushed the, 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 the limits of the Constitution. But the Constitution has withstood everything he's thrown at it. And I think that is one of the most interesting things when we look back on the Trump period, whether it's just one term or two, I think that's one thing that will be observed. Um, the other thing Last is about one. the UK, that um, one of the things that um, people sort of referred to, which I think you can look at more directly, there has been an assumption, I think, in almost the whole of the post-war period, that Britain is, if not best, then it's the capacity to be best and to be the leader. And what's happened with the pandemic is something very, very interesting, which is because everything is so presented in such a comparative light, a statistical light, and that it's global and European, it's actually been brought home to the UK that actually we haven't performed that well. Um, and I think that may, may actually give rise to a reappraisal in a whole lot of other areas. Okay, Joan, um, to you next. Okay, um, yeah, to come back then to Jojo's um, question and um, I guess David's ties in with that as well. Um, I mean, it is very striking that I think in the face of this incredible disruption um, that has taken place, which is, of course, largely a self-imposed one um, in terms of the lockdown and its um, incredibly disruptive impact on people's lives and, and the economy that, you know, which is going to cause um, a very, very deep recession across Europe, including here as well in the UK. In the face of that, the dearth of um, thinking and you know, ambition in terms of thinking about how to come out of this and the recovery phrase is really, really striking because the impulse uh, in terms of what's been put in place already in terms of the policies that it's all about fiscal, which is this incredible kind of fiscal and monetary policy response that we've seen. It's all about preserving as much as possible of what's there. Now, obviously some industries and sectors are not gonna come back in, in, in the same way, but as much as possible, that is the kind of limits of the, the, the kind of thinking, the policy be, behind the policies that have been put forward. You know, incredibly conservative and um, very much status quo oriented. And, um, you know, really show that the, the complete lack of awareness and appreciation of the fundamentally uh, fundamental structural economic problems uh, facing um, the Eurozone um, and also facing um, uh, the UK as well. And um, so it's a kind of, you know, status quo response. And, you know, that's, yeah, I agree with you. That's all that you hear from anybody. You know, um, I've listened to so many EU leaders in recent weeks, best for going so on. All they talk about is the Green New Deal. Um, and, and that's about the sum of it. Now in the UK, um, you know, my hope had always been that just as Brexit could be um, the occasion 
I mean, not, it was not going to change anything in and of itself, but it had the potential to change things, just as that could be potentially very disruptive in terms of um, uh, creating the opening and the possibility of a democratic political renewal in this country. Also, by the same token, that sort of um, disruption creates the possibility of um, doing something different. I mean, if that's what else, what is the point of Brexit unless it is to do something very different from what was done before in terms of the economy as well. And to some degree, we have seen lip service being paid to that, you know, in the period running up to the election and, 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 and so on and afterwards with the focus being on the, you know, perennial productivity problem, dearth of investment in infrastructure and, and education and innovation and so on. Um, and that's really what I was kind of hanging on to. Um, but again, we see that it's, you know, very limited in its ambition and scale. And at the moment, our political elites just seem to have lost the plot and to be very much focused on the kind of short term uh, and to even be losing sight of, of, of this. I mean, again, I think there's, there's not going to be an extension. I think we're going to leave the EU at the end of the year with a very um, uh, modest uh, trade deal or we're going to leave with uh, no deal at all and in some ways that's good but you know the, the point is that we've already this disruption and the impact of this is far far greater than anything you know uh, to, to be caused by 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 brexit so um the debate is there to be had and i think it's important that uh, people you know like yourselves um it, you know who are having these discussions make that your voice is heard because not all is over uh, in terms of this debate, both ab about uh, politics and democracy and also about what we want to do with our economy. When we take back control of the economy, what do we want to do with that? OK, thanks, Joan. So, Phil, I'm going to come to you for a few comments and then back out for a final round of questions. So, Phil, I, you're yeah. unmuted. Thank you. Uh, so I want to, there's things I'd like to revisit, such as the point raised by Phil Mullen about China bashing and the restoration of autarky. But there were two comments that were directly addressed to me, so I'll answer them now, which is the, um, I think it was Alec who said the incompatibility of democracy and globalization. I think the point that I was putting across was that it's been made so, but it's also been shown to be unsustainable. I mean, the reason that we're seeing the political fragmentation that we are and the political revolts um, at the ballot box and on the streets um, prior at least to the corona pandemic showed the fact that globalism, the political and legal form that globalization has taken over the last 20 years was unsustainable because it had no democratic legitimacy. So um, it's not that they're in, it's, I think that it in fact demonstrates that they are indeed compatible, that the only way to sustain international cooperation, the only way to sustain international connectivity is if it is democratically legitimated, if it has strong roots Within, demo within democracy and within civil society. And then very briefly to Ella, um, corona, the impact of Corona on public debate, it might've made it more difficult to cast globalist arguments, but I don't see that it has restored any kind of sense of um, national cohesion or political solidarities because all of the way in which our responses to Corona have been framed, have been framed around vulnerability and weakness and passivity. And that seems to me to be the main political problem stemming from the pandemic is overcoming the fear and the politics of fear that it seems to have entrenched because it reminds me as if it reminds me a lot of the war on terror, but on a much more sinister, in some ways, a more sinister and scaled up um, model. OK, thanks, Phil. There'll be a chance to come back to China in the end, because I'll give you a, I'll give you each a couple of minutes to sum up if, 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 if I can. Um, but let's get through this final round of questions. So I'm going to start with Sheila. So off you go. So just some very, very quick questions, mainly directed at Morris, actually, um, but others if there's time. So um, at the very beginning, Morris spoke about trade unions in particular and I'm just left wondering how we can demand recognition of trade unions by foreign investors when their history in this country is the destruction of the link between them as institutions and labor itself. You know, in my experience, they became a department of HR over the last 30 years. So if trade unions can be rebuilt and they can be turned into that positive force, then 
there is a global industry, which I'd just like a very quick question um, about. There's a global industry we absolutely need. Um, it's a Cinderella industry. It's work that absolutely cannot be done from home. It's where labor is in a human form, although it's also innovating and automating all the time and at the moment led by industrialists. And it's an industry that we may well need to consider nationalizing to function and that's construction. So again, I think construction and as, as an industry in some of these global economic discussions is sometimes underplayed and misunderstood. So imagine building all the stuff that we talk about. Um, I mean, one of the things that we did really well in a crisis was to kit out hospitals in nine days. Um, and lots of the people involved in those supply chains were indeed able to move quickly, um, regardless of the politics around all of that. Construction um, is one of those industries where the self-sufficiency that we could develop could be incredibly positive. And I do believe we've got the intellectual capacity and operational capacity in this country. So why don't we do it? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, again, it's one of those things that's run for years, but I just passionately believe we always need to build things. All right, thanks, Sheila. So James Woodhausen, I'm coming to you next. Off you go, James. Well, I, I uh, hate to enter a note of dissent, uh, but and Morris, I love you to bits, um, but I can't accept your comment, especially after what Phil Mullen has said about China bashing. And I quote you that China is the enemy. Uh, I think your proposal that labor law must be built into trade agreements uh, sounds very attractive, but I put it to you that the political economy you seem to be hinting at is that globalization uh, has meant that capital has searched for the uh, labor conditions and the suppression of labor, perhaps uh, poor wages with labor, and that's why it's decimated the Rust Belt in America or uh, um, the North in Britain, and it's moved to China for that reason, and therefore we got to fight that, and one way we can do that, in your view, is by you know threatening the Chinese about labor law. But I put it to you that that political economy is very one dimensional. It's what the liberal left likes to call a race to the bottom, that capital moves abroad and leaves Lancashire or whatever and goes to China because it always wants the conditions of greatest exploitation of labor. Actually, if you do your Marxism, the exploitation is higher in the advanced capitalist world than it is in uh, the developing countries. And uh, the real point is that capital goes to China for all sorts of reasons now, including although Alan's right to say democracy or the lack of it hasn't helped their innovation, capital goes to China for their innovation strengths, for their research and development, for their scale, just to be there for the future of electric cars. So to pose it as just a sort of, you know, a labor re a regime question, I think is wrong. And I think, but by the same token, to say that we should, you know, make that uh, labor conditions in China a condition of our negotiations uh, with them, we can't even make decent labor conditions available to NHS workers, Morris. We can't do it for gig economy workers here. And you're saying we should demand it of China. I hate the CCP. I hate the labor conditions there. But I'm not saying that we can go in there and tell them what to do. Is that what you're saying? Okay, thanks, James. I'm going to skip Alan for just now because he's already spoken. I'm going to come to Kerry. Off you go, Kerry. Hello, am I audible? Yes. Um, thank you. That were, they were really uh, helpful and eloquent and clear introductions. A couple of things. I do agree with uh, Phil's point that, and his flagging of China bashing and autarkic trends. And doesn't that suggest that what we're faced with coming out of lockdown in Britain and elsewhere is not a healthy return. I think Phil is saying this too, Phil Cunliffe, not a healthy return to ideas of the nation state and sovereignty, but sadly not a, you know, some great democratic renewal or belief in um, democracy at a national level, but actually a very backward one. 
and that the politics of fear and the virus have exacerbated that. So I'd like your thoughts on that. And the Green New Deal seems symptomatic of that in its um, you know, anti-development and it being another name for austerity. I, uh, I, but I wanted to ask what um, the speakers think, perhaps this goes on from what Ella was saying in terms of as we come out of this pandemic, the political ramifications publicly are likely to be given that in the main we've had globally obviously the you know riots and things in america aside at the moment just the complete shutdown of a public voice so in britain you can't say we have a functioning democracy or we really even know what the public think so perhaps in all of this um the politics of fear are the first thing we have to challenge. Yeah, um, great discussion. Um, I watched a film last night um, on Netflix. I don't know if people have seen it. It's called American Factory. Uh, it's worth watching. I think it's a useful example of probably America's problems and China's problems. Um, you know, a, a factory, com a big company comes from China to set up a windshield um, making factory in, in Ohio. And what was unbelievable about the whole thing was the nature of the American kind of workforce. You couldn't believe how demoralized and kind of flabby, which is, I don't want to be insulting, but is the kind of word I would use to describe how the American workforce were almost incapable of taking on the, what was proposed as a whole new possibility for you know, the working class people in that area to have jobs and so forth. And they couldn't really compete with the way that the Chinese factory was run, a similar factory in China, which was basically, you know, uh, peopled by what I can only call human automatons, uh, an unbelievable way uh, to live and to work, uh, uh, which I, I have no doubt would be completely un unsatisfactory to anybody in, in the Western world. It was inhuman in the nature of it. And if that is anything to go by in relation to how China productive capacity is so powerful, the working class are subject to that level of existence, then, you know, it, it, it's never going to be a beacon for, you know, for the world in order to be able to produce a kind of, you know, a society that's worth living in. And but similarly, I'm slightly disagreeing with Joan, perhaps, on America, you know, and its kind of sort of latent power or, you know, somewhat diminished, but nonetheless, you know, still existing. I can't see it. If, if that film was a metaphor for it, uh, then, you know, they have unbelievable problems in relation to not just their, um, you know, productive capacity and the working class people and how they're going to work, but also in relation to the culture that is, is, is so prevalent in American society. I mean, the American military, if they trip over on maneuvers, they're suffering from PTSD. You know, I can't see American soldiers, you know, being engaged in a war with the Chinese and winning it. Uh, uh, Maybe I'm going over the top, but um, you can see what I mean, that the broader culture in American society is one that, you know, does not seem to me to, you know, be, be exhibit sort of great power uh, or project great power. And just finally, um, you know, similarly with, China, sim similarly with China, you know, their problems is like Alan says, I can't see innovation emerging out of that particular type of society in a, in a, in a really powerful way. But um, I noticed... Um, last week that the EU has signed a deal with Japan, uh, a very high level deal, which they have agreed to fund the, w, uh, the, uh, the, the World Health Organization to the tune of, you know, uh, 730 million um, pounds, which is not big money, but it shows that they seem to be not too worried about, um, you know, basically slapping America in the face saying, you, you, you've kind of thrown away your relationship with with the World Health Organization, and we're prepared to pick it up. Thanks, Dennis. Um, so I'm going to take Alan and then come back to the panel. So panel, I'm going to take you just in the order that you've spoken um, and try and give you 90 seconds, a couple of minutes, just to a few final thoughts. I mean, respond to anything that's been raised if you want, but just give us your final thoughts if you can to, to take us away. But firstly, Alan, do you want to just uh, chip in, Alan, with whatever the question was you're going to ask? China, I'm looking at everything from China's point of view, but I'm not taking their point of view, is that that China is in a double whammy. China moves into a position 
where it wants to influence the world at precisely the time when the world is more unstable. So that's the generic position. So this is not China bashing, I hope, but also China is much more strategic than any other country in the world at the moment, even though there are probably problems inside the Politburo. What I mean by that is, if you take something like the Belt and Road Initiative, Kissinger described it as why chi, is go as opposed to chess. You play out there, you go out there, you find out what's going on, sometimes you win, sometimes you retreat, and then you get some level of acceptance. However, as Joan said, I think, is that, and other people have said, you don't get the same level of soft power. Chinese soft power in Africa is pretty limited, yes? Most people don't like it. They like the money, they like the dictatorships, they like the idea that you can have development without democracy, but it doesn't convince anybody. So that's a recurring problem. For the EU, um, going back to that, when I first started dealing with Chinese public officials and senior ministers, they thought the EU was federalist like the United States because they wanted it to be a counterbalance. So they thought the euro was going to be a counterbalance to the dollar. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah. So then the RMB became more important. The RMB then becomes more important in relation to Southeast Asia, which is the problem of regionalization and fragmentation. And it also, for Dominic, is the cherry picking. Yeah. Watch out. Somebody might come and buy your wife's company somewhere in Northern Italy in the Veneto. Yeah, not just the tourist traps in Venice, but more specifically Hong Kong. And this is, I think this is the, probably the most important thing in relationship to China, the US. US rhetoric in relationship to Hong Kong. What can they do? China is gambling that no one will stop them doing it politically because still Hong Kong is much more important economically. They just forced a major US investment bank to move out of Singapore into Hong Kong, Hong Kong so that they can get onshore investment because China still needs that. They still need that. So it's still a balance. I'm, I'm not sure. I, you know, I'm sorry. I'm I, I'd like to fi finish on an optimistic note. I'd like to finish on a non-China bashing note. But China's, China's foreign policy is so much more coherent than the United States. That's the thing we have to watch in the next three or five years. Sorry. All right, thanks. I apologize for that. So I, I want to bring the panel back in now, Chris, just to, in fairness, give them a couple of minutes just to, to make a few final thoughts. So I'm going to come to Phil uh, first. So Phil, I'm trying to unmute you now. Phil, maybe you want to unmute yourself. Yes, off you go. So I think, I mean, it's become common recently to talk about derangement syndromes and Brexit derangement syndrome, Trump derangement syndrome, all sorts of derangement syndromes. And I think China derangement syndrome is also very real. And indeed, it's kind of growing more powerful and um, sinister. And one thing that I think is very striking is, um, and I think very telling about how insidious, I think some of the these renewed yellow peril style arguments are, is that neocon arguments that were used to justify war in places, disastrous wars in places like Iraq and elsewhere, are being renewed in, in, relation to Chihu in relation to Hong Kong and Taiwan. And so the very fact that it's become an escape hatch for, people's whose for people whose arguments were so deeply discredited that they can recycle their um, claims um, and their belligerence through the form of China bashing is significant and important, I think, and indicates the degree of, um, the degree of danger, I think, that rests there for Western publics who would allow themselves to be avoid their own internal problems by projecting and externalizing them onto China. And I agree also with the danger which is posed by um, autarky or the idea of it being uh, appealing. It's not just that it's unappealing, the idea that we could all grow our um, carrots and potatoes you know, on our, by ourselves, but that it's also impossible. And that's the point that I tried to put across with the fact of greater globalization um, in terms of the financial interdependence of central banks in the West is a result of what's happened as a result of the corona pandemic. So we're actually more tightly globalized than we were before, not in terms of our supply chains, but in terms of our dependence on the Federal Reserve. Um, and that is an economic relationship that doesn't have any 
obvious um, political or immediate political solution. So beyond that, I would, and where I must disagree with Morris, when he says that globalization was the domination of capital, we're still under the domination of capital um, in the aftermath of uh, this period of neoliberal globalization. And I see no immediate change to that domination of capital. And in fact, it's, if anything, I would say that it's all of the negative tendencies of neoliberal politics and society are being amplified by the lockdown. It's still too early to tell whether or not um, the greater dignity that attaches to labor as a result of um, the corona pandemic, um, the fact that there are so many people whose work is now considered essential, which who people who do menial, um, menial, difficult, hard, physical labor, that they're considered essential rather than being um, looked down upon, whether or not that translates into a greater sense of um, the interests of producers and the interests of working class people, it's too early to tell. But so far, I think it's, um, there's no evidence that it, that it has. Um, and then finally, with to this, and I'll close on this, is to go back to a point that was raised by J.J. Charlesworth right at the start as to how there is, how do we generate the set of ideas to undertake the kind of political and national renewal that's needed. And the problem is that it's um, precisely the political capacity to do that has been degraded over the last 20, 30 years. And that is the character of neoliberal politics and society to contract out decision-making, to hem in what's possible to, what, to limit well, where the public can have a say and what the public can decide upon. And as a result of that, all of those public capacities to generate political legitimacy, to generate democratic solidarity, to generate political power through processes of collective decision-making have shriveled away and they won't be quickly restored. Um, but we could certainly do with a start by um, ending, I think one good first step would be to end the lockdown and to try and brush aside the politics of fear that has come, that has been associated with the pandemic. Uh, thanks, Phil. Mary, uh, your just a few final thoughts, please. Yes, I've got one final thought um, on China and the way everybody seems to have been ganging up on China. Um, at least in the United States, this is something not new at all. I was based in Washington, the second Clinton administration, and there was a very, very strong stream in Congress, not just in the Republican Party, that was putting out reports very, very hostile to China. So this is not unique to Trump. It's not something that's suddenly arisen. It's something that is is, has been there and is very deep rooted and so it's very easy for Trump to capitalize on it um, so uh, it becomes a sort of popular cause. Um, and the second thing I'd like to do is I'd like to um, introduce a whole new subject um, in answer to um, to a question which was put um, about um, whether there might be a rapprochement with Russia. Um, I think, um, and this is really um, maybe stretching a point, but I think we can already see that Russia sends uh, an opportunity in the UK um, detached from Europe and that it's not gone without a response. Um, when Boris Johnson was in hospital, um, world leaders sent their um, wishes for his recovery. And one of the most fulsome, one of the most sympathetic came from Vladimir Putin. And it wasn't meant with any degree of irony. It was entirely serious. And Boris Johnson reciprocated with that um, for Russia's Victory Day when he sent an unusually warm message to Russia of congratulations on Victory Day. Now, it was easier for um, Boris Johnson because the Victory Parade, which would have been um, a difficult um, invitation to decide whether to go or stay away, um, that had been postponed because of the virus. But the, um, this message was not reported very much in the British press. It was very summarily reported in Downing Street. We only know about it because it was reported extremely warmly by the official Russian news agency, TASS. So I think this is, um, this is a story which we need to watch. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Mary. So, uh, Morris, I'm coming to you next and you're unmuted. Okay, thank you. Um, so I just want to say just, just initially a real gratitude and thank you. This, this has been very good. I'll, I'll focus in on 
two things, but before I do, I, I just want to say to the people who've been writing and people who are engaged, I put my email up, so I really want to continue the discussion, but I'll just first of all respond to, to Sheila. Uh, so tonight I've been trying to talk, tried to talk about internationalism and globalization and, and, and those areas. Obviously, the intensity of my commitment is, is much more domestic. And I conceptualize that as a sort of action on our own society and country. You know, what has happened to Labour it has been a very distressing story. You're completely right about construction. It's one of the main growth areas in the economy, as is relational work. I mean, IT is well behind, IT and tech is well behind that. So how we actually think about rebuilding the country is central. And, and that links up to James, um, just to say, with I really would love to continue this conversation at a reasonable length. So please be in touch with me and maybe we could organize with others uh, a conversation around this. Um, once again, in, in relation to this, the ability of human beings to associate and represent their interests seems to be fundamental if we're gonna change the dynamics of globalization as an inhumane system. Um, when I say inhumane, I mean the, the commodification of human beings um, by, by capital. So I just want to open up that space, James, to continue a conversation uh, with you. And, and I would love to do that and to apologize to people for not responding. And the final note, Mary, I did clock that with Russia. And we do have to think, just to conclude this, um, about the sort of coalitions that we wish to build now and, and one of those must be with Russia and to intensify a relationship with Germany too in relation to that. And I think the space is open there. And also to talk about, you know, very, as my last thing about islands which are threatened by rising sea levels and forms of mainland domination. I think we should take the lead in doing that. Okay, thanks, Morris. And finally, Joan. So thanks for the discussion. Thanks for all the questions. Uh, some really interesting points and contributions have been made. I can't possibly answer all the questions, so just a few points. That was really interesting, Mary, what you said about um, that exchange between Putin and uh, Boris Johnson. Um, because I always thought, you know, could something change here in terms of a kind of reset post-Brexit with Russia and the UK? Because um, I kind of was kind of skeptical about it, really, because, you know, the Brits are always the most kind of r r Russophobic of, um, of the Europeans in, in, in many ways. And that's what we've seen in recent years. So that that would be quite interesting in keeping <laughs> options open. But in general, um, you know, somebody else was making the point earlier as well about Russia. Could Russia kind of come back in the fold? I actually don't think so. You know, Russia hasn't gone away. Um, and it's been acting in concert with China, as we've seen over the past few days. Russia shares China's intense resentment of the US domination of the global order. Unlike China, which wants bipolarity, Russia wants multipolarity. And that's what it's been seeking to achieve through its um, return to the international stage in, in recent years in the Middle East and, and so on. And I think as the US-China rivalry increases russia china relations are going to be strengthened and to come closer um, and that doesn't mean to say that it's going to become some kind of strategic alliance or anything like that because russia would never accept that um, but I, I i think you know that makes it quite difficult um, although ultimately i would say that what is in russia's interest in terms of the future global order would be what is in Europe's interest. So anyway, that's just to throw that out. Finally, on the China bashing, um, I agree again with Mary that this is, is not anything new, um, and not just in the US where it's been uh, around for a very long time. It's a bipartisan issue. Obviously it doesn't help. This is a US presidential year, but also in the EU as well. It was early 2019 when the EU, the European Commission declared China to be a systemic rival and a strategic competitor. And that was um, in the context of its new FDI screening uh, measures that it's put in place and which is strengthened, you might have noticed in recent months as well, which is basically a protectionist measure dressed up 
uh, as, a, as a security matter. Uh, and they are obviously right to be concerned about China and cherry picking, to go back to Dominic's uh, question. And I think, um, first, on the one hand, there's an exaggeration of the scope of China's involvement in a country such as Greece, where it's, you know, quite played a very prominent role in the development of Piraeus Port and Thessaloniki now as well. Um, but it's, uh, it's it, it, in the scheme of things, it's not massive. It's a different matter in Eastern Europe and in Africa and parts of Latin America as well. And I think, yeah, depending on what happens in the EU, you, Italy, um, I just, uh, there's been some fascinating surveys, Italians with positive views of the following countries, percentage of respondents, China, more than 50%, this is in recent weeks, um, uh, positive view of Russia, 30%, view of the US, something like, 18% and view of the EU, very low as well. So, you know, there's certainly um, a, a scope there for China to extend its role. And I would say that, and, and one caveat to the, the idea that China, China bashing is everywhere, it's not everywhere. And there's a certain ambivalence and, uh, about China in other places, including in parts of Europe, in Eastern Europe, uh, in Italy, and what China will be trying to do is basically neutralize the antipathy um, and uh, antagonisms and um, extend its influence where it can, which it has already done quite effectively, where it's actually been able to establish an alternative to the kind of rules-based Western order in parts of the world already. Thank you very much, John. Um, I want to. Um, I just want to thank uh, all the panel for their their contributions. It's and, and and to yourselves as well. I know we've gone a little bit over uh, the stated finish time, but um, I just think that in these sorts of discussions, it's always uh, quite difficult to get the balance between. Uh, giving the speakers enough time to get the depth of information in that, that they need to make their points. So I, th I think it's worthwhile letting it run on a bit. And I thought, you know, they, they did a brilliant job, especially as I was harrying them along to uh, try and quicken them up. But I thought they were fantastic uh, introductions and it was a really interesting discussion. So thanks both to the panel uh, and to all of you for, uh, for coming along and making such good contributions. I just want to finish with three very quick things. Firstly, there's been people donating through the course of this uh, this conversation and I really want to thank them for doing that and also for anybody who's not yet had a chance to donate that if you can then do visit uh, academyofideas.org.uk forward slash donate and you'll be able to uh, give us a little contribution to keep going if, if you can see your way to doing that. Finally, two final things, which is events coming up. This Wednesday uh, at 6.30 p.m., and I want to stress actually 6.30 p.m. because it's a slightly different starting time from what we usually have. Uh, we have a In Conversation, uh, Academy of Ideas event In Conversation, Moral Responses to the Pandemic with Susan Nyman and Frank Ferreira. Uh, it's an international collaboration with uh, our Berlin colleagues, Freiblich Institute. Uh, and it's going to look at some of the moral challenges uh, of, of this pandemic. What does it mean to be moral? What's the space for individual judgment and exercising moral autonomy? So if you want to come along to that, that's 6.30 on uh, Wednesday night. And then the second thing is that the fourth in the series of these AOI online events is going to be on Thursday, the 25th of June. And we're going to take a look at coronavirus. Has the NHS had a good crisis? And there'll be, uh, there, well, there is lots of details already on the website about that discussion and we'll be adding speakers over, over the coming week. So that's more or less it. Thanks again uh, to the panel and to all of you for coming along. I hope you enjoyed it and uh, hope to see, see you for the next one.